Hi, welcome to Lewis Spotlight. I'm Dr. Jackie White from the English Department and I'm here today to talk to you about some life lessons. My childhood. It was a good childhood. <laughs> we looked a lot alike, my sister and I growing up, so my mother who loved fashion and interior design and everything like that would make us outfits and dress us the same. Um, which of course at the time we hated, but um, now when we look back at the pictures we think, you know, how cute we are. <laughs> um, so there were some hard times, so I'll say that too, and, and my parents were very perseverant. Um, my dad had juvenile diabetes and um, and juvenile arthritis or something, I don't know. I just remember vaguely that there were times he was gone. And so my mother's juggling these three kids. You know, of course, there were the, the times where, you know, you hate your parents and you run away from home and those sorts of things. But um, all in all, a very, very loving and cohesive family. And um, we were always encouraged to, to take risks and to do things and not to, not to give up. So. I tried out for cheerleading um, and I didn't get it. And so I was like, okay, I'm done. And my mother's like, no, you're gonna try out for basketball, you're gonna try out for wrestling, you're gonna try out to you become a cheerleader. You know, and at that point then I didn't even wanna do it, but I did it and I did it one year and I was like, okay. So I think, you know, kind of watching my parents' work ethic and um, how they always emphasize, you know, we had to have dinner as a family, we couldn't watch TV during dinner. Those kind of values were, were really important and I think um, have kept us close as a family since. Yeah. My sister and I were the first in our families to go to college. Um, she went to Greenville and I went to Eureka. And my parents said, we'll support you if you go to a um, uh, you know, Christian affiliated school that's within reasonable driving distance. Because I had been, I had gone to um, Wyoming on some church trips and fell in love with Wyoming. So I was like, I'm going to the University of Wyoming. I'm going to become a cowgirl. Um, my parents said, yeah, then it's on your dime. So my childhood emphasized the importance of family because um, w through thick or thin, you know, we, we did everything together and um, you need that support, you know. Um, I think it, it also came because through, you know, through our um, religious beliefs and um, because my, my parents both had really close families too, mm -hmm. you know, so our extended family was also close we would have our cousins over and things like that all the time. And, um, and that was just kind of like number one, family before anything. My most memorable life experience and what I took from it. Um, I would say uh, my mother dying, that's not a positive one, but you know, you have to kind of, well, you, if you come through grief, I think, then you are a s stronger person than you ever knew you could be. So um, she died on February 1st, 2011, and it was, you know, this horrible snowstorm here. So I had, um, I knew that she, she was ill. She was in the hospital and she had been in, in and out of a coma. She had cerebral hemorrhaging from a couple falls that happened the November before. And um, so I had planned to fly down there the weekend of February 4th or whatever that was. And um, so then my dad called me at whatever it was, two o'clock in the morning or my sister and said, you know, She's gone, so then I'm scrambling to change my airline ticket to go th as soon as possible. And I got out of O'Hare at like eight in the morning and they shut it down at 10. Um, Lakeshore Drive, you know, everything was shut down. So, um, so, you know, and it was really difficult to, to have not been there when she died. And then of course, you know, um, people said to me, well, maybe she didn't want you there. And then that really hurt because, you know, in a sense, um, when, when my little brother was born, you know, then you kind of go through this abandonment thing too. You're no longer the baby and all of that. And, um, and then subsequently my mother had had lymphoma when she was in her 40s um, and obviously survived. Um, but that was a really difficult to issue too. So um, that she survived that and she was such a fighter. You know, she was a very, very feisty woman. And um, I try to channel her as yeah. much as I can. 
Um, and if you look at the new English department, you can see that I've channeled her interior decorating as much as I can. Um, but, but losing, I, I had never thought, you know, I mean, I knew that she was going to die, but I never thought that it would affect me so, so, so profoundly. Um, and, you know, still uh, to this day, I, I would say it took me three years. I was in a tunnel of darkness, kind of of grief for three years. Um, and then this summer, this is the second event, because I know you only asked me for one, but um, another life-changing thing um, was going to Rome with the International Association of Lasallian Leadership. I don't remember, YALU. Um, so I was in Rome for two weeks this summer um, in a formation program at the mother house of the Christian brothers, the Lasallian brothers, with two other colleagues from Lewis, Dr. Renfro in education and, and Pat Breda in nursing. And we met 46 other faculty from um, Lasallian universities across the globe. So three from Bethlehem, um, two from Barcelona, two from Brazil, nine from the Philippines, 12 from Mexico, one from Kenya, one from Ivory Coast, one from Jamaica, um, and then I think maybe 10 other folks from the United States. Um, and it was just a really profound experience and I think contributed significantly to my healing, you know, from this. So, um, and again, because I think it was, like we kind of, we created a family, this group, and, and the facilitators, the organizers said, this is the most cohesive, um, collegial, collaborative, fun-loving, easygoing group we've ever had. You know, we had two days, for example, where we could go off on our own, mm -hmm. and we all went off together. It was really phenomenal. And, um, yeah, so, you know, and I still think that there are things, like when that happened, I wanted to call my mother. Um, and and the, the other sad thing was, well, hard thing, I guess, is the day of my mother's funeral, I got an email from Brother James saying that I had been awarded um, tenure and promotion. And, and I should have been thrilled, <laughs> you know. I mean, I had worked really, really hard to do that. Um, and, I, and I, you know, I wanted to, to be connected with Lewis forever. But, you know, in that, in that context, it was kind of like, really? So what? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and my mother doesn't know. Every poem I published, she would share with her friends. She had a whole shelf of, you know, everything I had done. When I got my PhD, every time she wrote me, it was Dr. Jackie White. Every envelope I got from her after that. Um, and uh, I would you know, go to Florida to visit them and she would be like, this is my daughter, she's a professor. This is my daughter, Dr. White. Um, you know, so I know that she was really proud and now when those things kind of happen, you're like, well, where's my cheerleader? But I think that it's, it's really important to focus on the moment and so, for me, the best thing that has happened to me is the thing that's happening now. Yeah. You know, this interview. Mm -hmm. This is cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, or giving the convocation speech. That was cool. So I taught in Japan for um, a year and a half, or through the summer, so I usually count it as two years. And, um, and this is what I think is so important about making good, creating good relationships, building good relationships while you're in, in school, um, which is a major kind of life lesson that I'm really stressing with students, um, is because the way I got to go to Japan was because someone from Eureka had been asked to start a starter liberal arts school in Tokyo. And so Japanese nationals would go to this school, they would learn in English, they would read in English, they would have like a liberal arts college experience freshman, sophomore year, and then transfer to different schools in the United States with whom we had agreements. So that was F Phil. And so Phil got this appointment and he called the English department at, at Eureka and said, you know, are there any recent graduates with master's degrees that you would recommend, you know, to come here and, and teach in our English department. And three professors gave my name. Nice. So um, he called me. And this was really important because I had um, finished my master's degree 
I had been working for a chiropractor and I loved working for him and I continually, you know, got to do new things. So pretty soon I was not just the receptionist, I was doing exams, I was taking the, the x-rays and developing the x-rays and marking the x-rays. And um, so Dr. Strell um, said, you know, really, you should think about becoming a chiropractor. And I said, no, I want to become, <laughs> you know, I want to teach English. English is my passion, literature, language, these are my passions. And the phone rings. And it's Phil saying, hi, you know, I'm Phil Palin. I want to hire you to, you know, are you, would you be interested in teaching in Tokyo? And I said, Tokyo, Japan? Because, you know, there's Paris, Illinois. There's, I don't know, Frankfurt, Illinois. So um, London, Iowa, whatever. And he said, yeah, Tokyo, Japan. And this was in the late, no, this was in the early 90s. Well, late 80s, early 90s. And the yen was like hugely strong against the dollar. And to live in Japan was so prohibitively expensive. So my second question was, who, who's paying for my housing? And he said, no, we'll pay for your housing. We'll give you an apartment. Um, We'll, you know, we'll take care of utilities, you teach, you get your salary, that's it. You know, feed yourself, um, clothe yourself, but pretty much everything else is, is done. So I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said that my third question, of course, was do I need to know Japanese? And he said, well, actually, we kind of prefer you not to because the students need to do everything in English, and the more Japanese you know, the more you're likely to allow them to sort of slip. And I, and I went to Tokyo, and I... And, um, I didn't know anybody. Um, and um, so the vice president picked me up at, at uh, Narita, the airport, and took me to this apartment and dropped me off. And it was, I don't know, 10 o'clock at night, mm -hmm. okay? So I sleep on this mat. I don't know what I'm doing, you know? They have tatami mat floors, they have futons and stuff. So, um, and I woke up in the morning and, I, and it was all tropical and bright and sunny and there were strange animal noises and so forth. And I thought, where am I? <laughs> you know, you're jet lagged and all this sort of stuff. And, and, and I thought, oh yeah, oh yeah, you're in Japan. So I get up and I just go wandering. Then I went and I found the metro train and I got on the train. I wanted to see where it would go. Um, I didn't know where, you know, to, to get off the train. So I just stayed on it and went to the station. <laughs> But you know, the, one of the really beautiful things about the, about the Japanese um, people is they are so kind. They're so kind and, um, and patient. And so, you know, in broken English, Japanese, whatever, uh, the conductor said, you know, just stay on the train because it's going to leave the station again and take you back where you came from. So, um, but I, uh, I ended up rooming with um, a woman with whom I'm still really good friends. She was just here in Chicago with her daughter, and we went to see One Direction. I think that's the name of the group. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that was an experience. Yeah. But and hung out in Chicago together. Um, she lives in Colorado. So um, again, just formed some really great um, friendships. The pace of the United States is so frenetic. Mm -hmm. The pace of the rest of the world is not. Um, and I think you can't. You know, we, I think a, a huge lesson, I think everyone from the United States should have to travel abroad because then you will learn um, not to impose our cultural values, you know, on, on other people. I had Mrs. Hapwood in third grade and she had us write poems and I wrote a poem about autumn, I don't have it anymore, and she posted it on the bulletin board. And I thought, oh, this is cool. <laughs> it's fun. You could do beautiful things with language. Um, and and I just, I've always loved the way that language works and exploring you know, the limits of language. That's why I'm, I, I've taken up translation as well. Um, I love the music of poetry. Um, so I, I studied clarinet. I studied bassoon. I tried too late to take up the piano. But um, I like the succinctness of poetry, well, we're not talking epic poems, okay, we're talking the lyric poem. Um, and, and again, this kind of this ability to explore things from another side of yourself to, you know, in a dramatic monologue, for example, to be someone else um, or some other thing. You can write in the voice of a t-shirt, you can write in the voice of the coffee pot, you can write in the voice of the squirrel that's, you know, in your attic and you don't want it there. And then um, I just, uh, you know, I would love to read it. I, I fell in love with Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson, of course, very early. When you get your first big paying job, live on half of what you make. 
because you're already used to being poor, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so don't go out and buy the new car. Don't go out and get a mortgage you can't um, afford. You know, don't necessarily rush into having children if you can help it. Um, and, and just, you know, try to live on as little as possible and build up your savings because then you can do these kinds of things. You can travel to Russia because you don't have a job. You can work for six years at the Math and Science Academy, again, making a really good salary, saving a third, maybe, of what, of what you're making, and then decide to take two years off and write full time before you go back to graduate school. These are the things you can do while you're also building your retirement portfolio. Through the poetry, I discover the life lessons. For the most part, um, when you start a poem, you might have an idea, but usually you have a phrase, usually you have a rhythm, usually you have an image, and you just start writing. And because you follow the image or the music, um, you find yourself writing things you didn't know you were going to write. So that first draft is really a draft of discovery. What does the poem want to be? And I think visual artists would say the same thing. You start painting or you start sculpting and you see what does this want to be. Um, and then when you go into the revising, which is where you spend the three years or whatever it is on a single poem, um, then you can start to um, sculpt the poem toward um, toward the kind of highlighting of what you discovered in it, the life lesson or the, and I guess, yeah, poetry is full of life lessons. So I think that's the excitement. That's why, that's why writers write, artists create, um, because it's, it's always an act of discovery. For example, after my mother died, I didn't write at all. Um, I couldn't write, I couldn't read. Everything, language, you know, was dead to me. Um, and then I started, you know, easing myself back into that. And actually, I think I woke up one morning with an image in my head, um, and, and then I wrote down that image. And then I decided, let me look at what other people have done with grief. And, um, and then I started just pouring all of my anger and, you know, frustration and angst and doubt and more anger and, <laughs> um, and, and sadness and all of that in, into the poems. And, you know, I think the life lesson I discovered there is that creativity always heals. Creativity is what heals you. You have to make something, you know, out of, out of the loss. And you have to make something beautiful out of the loss. You know, and, and it, could be a, it could be a simple thing. It doesn't have to be, you know, your, your mother dying, but, um, you know, you get, a, you, you get a bad grade on a paper, you don't get the parking spot you wanted, um, somebody does something in traffic you don't like. You know, then I usually try to, I, I always make up stories. I'm not a fiction writer, but in these cases I make up stories. And be, well, they must be late to see their mother before she dies, or they must be distracted because they heard bad news before they left the house or they must need this parking spot more than I do because they strained themselves, you know, in their workout this morning. So, you know, I try to give people a compassionate benefit of the doubt. You never, you never know somebody else's whole story. You never know. Um, and I think poetry is, is good for getting at that too. Um, yeah, so I guess the life lessons of poetry are read it to discover, write it to discover. Um, it, it keeps you alive. There's no culture, there's no historical moment on this planet where, that, that doesn't have poetry. I'm teaching because I didn't want to teach. And this is a good life lesson as well. When we moved to the house in Plainfield, we had this huge walk-in closet and it connected actually my sister's room and my room until of course my room was taken over by that little brother I told you about. Um, so, so um, my mother put a chalkboard in there. I don't know why. That's why. Anyway, um, and, and I would make my friends come over in the summer and sit on the suitcases because we stored them in this walk-in closet, and I would teach them, and I would put lessons on the chalkboard. I would make worksheets, math, science, English, everything, history, social studies, whatever it was called then, art. You know, I taught them the whole curriculum. 
and um, and I would quiz, give them quizzes and everything, writing assignments. I would grade this stuff. So I did that for I think third, fourth, and and fifth grade for the summers. So you know, then I go into junior high, I go into high school, and everybody says, "Oh, Jackie's going to be a teacher. Jackie's going to be a teacher. Jackie's going to be a teacher." And I became a poet, right? I wanted to be a poet at that point. Um, so I went to um, college. I did my undergrad. I double majored in English and history, and I took no education courses. I said no. I refused to teach. I refused to teach because everybody's been telling me what to do, and I was the baby for so long, and I'm just tired. Mm -hmm right, of everybody telling me what to do. Well, stubbornness is not a good thing, okay? And whether you believe in God or some divine force, there is, there is a force in the universe, and it will smack you upside the head. Gently sometimes, more forcibly at others. Um, but when it smacks you, you, you listen. So um, I uh, got my master's in creative writing. Then I got the call to go to, to IMSA and teach, and it was horrible. Um, because, you know, I didn't really know anything about teaching. And so, um, so um, then I got the call to go to Japan. And when I taught in Japan, it was um, euphoric. I mean, I was just, it was a euphoric experience. I loved interacting with the students. I loved sharing with them what I knew, what I cared about. Um, I loved seeing them grow. I loved piquing their curiosity. Um, so I love discovering what they were discovering, you know, in their writing and, and all that sort of thing. And, and then I was hooked. And then I was hooked. So when I got back from Japan, I took um, education courses. I went back and I did a part. I didn't get a full master's in education because I already had a master's. But I took the courses I needed to to be certified. So um, I did my student teaching in Batavia. And, um, and then I got asked back to IMSA. But when I was um, at the Math and Science Academy and I was able to develop a course of my own, I did one in um, American poetry, by which I mean the whole hemisphere. And I started doing a lot of South American literature. And I came across this poem by Julia de Burgos. And I decided I needed to learn more. So that's when I went back and got my PhD and did a concentration in, in Latino and Latin American studies. Um, and then Lewis. So I am getting to Lewis. Mm -hmm. When I was in junior high, my brother was a scout. He actually, my older brother, Scott the Carpenter, and he became an Eagle Scout. And they had um, a ceremony at Lewis. Now, I lived in Plainfield. I live on Center Street. So we drove past Lewis all the time. And when I had been in DeKalb, my, um, we lived in a duplex, and my girlfriend next door's father was an English professor at NIU and he took us once in his car full of books to see his office full of books that made an impression but then driving by Lewis when we when we pulled up that lane for my brother's thing I thought oh my gosh when I grow up I want to teach here and drive a yellow Volkswagen Beetle that's what I thought and I really didn't think about that little vision you know until I was in graduate school and um, there was a, a job ad for a creative writer at Lewis. But I was just starting my dissertation, so I said, I'm not going to overburden myself. This is another thing to learn. Mm -hmm. So there's an opportunity. Some opportunities are just um, whispering, you know, and then there are the ones that are the pounding on the door. So you have to, you have to be willing, I think, to sometimes. And I don't think most people ever talk about this, but you have to be willing sometimes to let an opportunity go. So I let it go, and Dr. Mensch came here, which is fabulous. Um, and the reason I know that was right is because the year later, when I finished my PhD, Lewis also had another job ad, and they wanted to hire someone in Latino and Latin American studies. Ha! Huh? Yeah. So I'm thinking, this is it. The dream is going to happen. I came to the interview. I did the interview. I was the second choice of the interview. Didn't get the job. So of course, now I'm doubting myself. You should have taken the first job. I don't care if Simone is your friend. You know, you let your vision go and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, so I'm miserable for about two weeks. And then I get a phone call. And it's Dr. Workman from the English department. She says, well, we actually have an opening in English. And we were so impressed with your um, interview and all of that um, that we'd like you to come back and talk to us about possibly taking on this, this fill-in position. Um, for us. And I said, sure, I'll come back. 
And I did, and the interview went well, and I got home, and they called me and said, Dr. Workman said, you know, we forgot to ask you, but um, can you teach Native American literature? And I said, no. I don't know anything about Native American literature. You know, I know Latino. Latino and Native, they're not really the same. Um, so there was like this silence on the other end of the phone. You know, I'm sure she was horrified. <laughs> What's wrong with this person who needs a job? Um, but you know, I didn't want to get myself, I didn't want to lie. I didn't want to get myself in over my head. And, and the universe, God, whatever, rewarded me because then she said, will you teach Native American literature? And I said, Nancy, I will teach anything you want me to teach. <laughs> but I want you to know that I don't have expertise in that area. And she said, that's OK, because Elaine can help you. And so like, you know, that whole summer, I was just like crash course in Native American literature, which I'm teaching this semester. And I've taught it now five or six times. Love it is a fabulous class. So um, and this is a cool thing about Lewis, is you have these opportunities to explore new areas. Um, so I do teach poetry. I do teach Latino and Latin American, but I also get to teach young adult and native and so forth. And, um, and so when I hung up the phone from, from getting the, OK, you have a job at Lewis, I went to the Volkswagen dealership. And I bought my yellow bug, which this is the miracle. This is how the universe is so, so um, prolific in its blessings and surprises. Um, they had stopped making the Volkswagen Beetle. And then they started making it again, I think like three years before this all happened. So I had my dream. <laughs>